to Wellness by Designs. I'm your host, Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us today is Todd Mansfield, a clinical herbalist practicing in Byron Bay, Australia. And today we're going to be discussing methane dominant SIBO and all that that entails. Welcome to Wellness by Designs. Todd, how are you? Thank you, Andrew. Happy to be here. Pleasure to have you on, sir. Now, <laughs> let's first discuss SIBO. What, are, what types are there? What presentations do they sort of commonly come with? And also, what's LEMO? <laughs> so we're going to quickly fall into acronym soup here. So, you know, if we're talking about SIBO, we've got uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, and we can kind of divide it into three subcategories. We can see hydrogen dominant SIBO, methane dominant SIBO, which we're going to be talking a lot about today. It's mainly what I uh, treat in my practice, makes up a big chunk of my, uh, you know, my, uh, my clients. And we've also got the uh, hydrogen sulfide dominant SIBO. We're just starting to tease that one out. There's still a lot of kind of questions around hydrogen sulfide SIBO and, uh, you know, just kind of SIBO in general. If we're talking about LIMO, large intestinal methane overgrowth, we're talking about this kind of over-representation of methane being produced in the large bowel. So SIBO, methane dominant SIBO, we've got the methane production in the small bowel, and then LIMO, we've got a methane kind of overproduction in the large bowel. We can talk about how you know the uh, client might kind of present differently, but uh, there's this big overlap between the two and they're often kind of um, happening at the same time as well. Gotcha. Okay, well, let's go through presentation. Um, I mean, obviously you spoke about methane dominant um, SIBO. How do you assess patients on first intake? And then how do you get to a differential diagnosis? Mm, yeah, great question. I mean, first off, and I think this is really important for clinicians listening, like the small bowel is totally being ignored by conventional medicine. You know, most mm. doctors, standard GPs, even gastroenterologists that aren't kind of up on the uh, latest research, they won't have the foggiest on kind of what SIBO is. Um, and I see these patients, you know, some of them have been unwell presenting these symptoms where even on like an intake form, you'll be like, oh, we're going to explore the possibility of SIBO straight off the cuff. And they've been going around and around in circles trying to find a reason why, uh, you know, they're experiencing these symptoms. So number one, first and foremost, bloating and distension. Um, as soon as I kind of see that on an intake form or a patient kind of, uh, you know, tells me about that, I'm starting to think, okay, maybe the small bowel is involved with methane, it gets a little bit more nuanced, and that's because of methane's impact on the gastrointestinal tract. And we're going to really dive into that today. There's a few pearls that I'd love to share. You know, any practitioner listening, but bloating and distension is really big, particularly if it worsens after meals. Not always with methane. Like that's a huge pearl. Patients can be bloated and distended perpetually, and it might not change. But frequently, they'll eat meals postprandially, they'll experience this bloating and distension. Frequently, they'll experience flatulence, sometimes burping, even reflux, like this really kind of upper digestive presentation. And then when we're really kind of like trying to tease it out, they might be experiencing things like joint pain after meals, fatigue after meals, even this kind of um, nauseousness after meals as well can be a clue that we want to be uh, looking into SIBO as a differential for sure. Gotcha. But obviously we've got to, you know, A, start off simply, you know, with the cephalic phase of eating, chewing properly, making sure that the digestive mm. processes are happening. But then you've, I guess you've also got to, um, you know, think about other differential diagnosis. What about Helicobacter pylori? What about peptic ulcer, cancer even? Um, mm. I mean, mind soup. <laughs> how, do you, how do you work that out on your intake? Like, do your patients often come as a referral from other health professionals, like medical health professionals? Have they been everywhere, seen everybody? 
a lot of them are looking for answers, you know, and so a lot of my patients, they're very interested in the research. I do a whole lot of writing, do little kind of videos on YouTube, just trying to kind of reach out to these patients who are kind of going around in circles and say, look, there is a way to assess. And most times when we look at the small bowel, if these symptoms are kind of lining up, you know, we get a strike rate. You know, if I suspect SIBO and we assess them properly, it comes back about kind of 85% of the time positive. And that, that sounds like a really kind of big um, kind of success rate on, on a positive test. And I remember um, Dr. Mark Pimentel, who's the kind of like guru of SIBO, re uh, SIBO research, he was saying, when they present with SIBO symptoms, <laughs> test them for SIBO. It's, uh, you know, it's not a sure thing, but it's definitely worth kind of uh, evaluating and not, not just going on to uh, the large bowel, which I, I really feel like most of our um, industry is overly focused on the large bowel and just neglecting that small bowel. You know, it's the longest segment of the human gut. It's important for nutrient digestion. You've got brush border enzymes that are kind of, um, you know, made and released there, triggers this kind of pancreatic release of, uh, of these pancreatic enzymes. You know, it's important with kind of endocrine and exocrine function. It's kind of like the powerhouse of nutrient absorption and then a huge piece, immune kind of function as well. That, that's just a huge piece of the small bowel. Payers patches, yeah. yes. That's right. Yeah. yeah. The good old the good old M cells and the panath cells. I remember them well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, good old physiology, anatomy and physiology. Um, exactly. Okay, so, Can't go past so, it. Yeah. And you've also got, particularly in the northern rivers where you practice, you know, you've got a, this big um, preponderance for blastocystis and other parasites. There's, there seems to uh -huh. be this... You know, I don't know whether it is really a concentration, but let's say an awareness of the concentration mm. there, blasto, um, um, diantamoeba fragilis, other parasites. Mm. So how, again, do you tease apart? Do you look for symptoms like it's not just wind but really smelly wind? Is it cyclical? Mm -hmm. Like what does your intake form tease up, tease apart? Yeah, so for me, it's really that kind of postprandial, and we're looking for like a symptom um, flare or an exacerbation within an hour. Sometimes, particularly with methane, and again, we'll get into why, I'll kind of stretch that out a little bit longer and I'll say, look, you know, within that two hour window post meals, doesn't have to be every meal as well. So, you know, that's, that's a big piece as well. But if you get a symptom flare, that's really the time where these kind of food triggers and, you know, antigens, if we're dealing with this kind of intestinal hyperpermeability picture, they're passing through that section. And that's where we're going to see this symptom flare. So if I'm picking up on that, even if I'm suspecting, I think it is so well worth the money to, um, to do a couple breath tests. That's being really, really kind of just covering all our bases. And uh, again, like I say, frequently they'll come back, um, positive, there is always a caveat around uh, SIBO breath test interpretation. Um, and I think, you know, we're still trying to tease it out. There was like a North American consensus paper. A lot of the gastroenterologists that are deep in this are still undecided and on the fence, and we don't really know how to interpret SIBO tests, but it's more data. And for me, you know, I hear some clinicians, they say, oh, look, you know, breath testing isn't the most reliable, granted, but it still gives us data, particularly around methane as well. Yeah, this is the sort of thing, like I've, I remember going through this, and I am still on that fence about the uneasiness of how sensitive and specific it is, but mm -hmm. what else have you got? So, you know, there exactly. are many conditions where, the testing or the therapy isn't perfect, but what to do, mm. you know, def d tell me one doctor in the world who can medically treat um, growing pains because it doesn't mm. exist in any medical text. Mm. It's, it's yeah. not a, it's not a dis disorder. So, um, so I get that too. Uh, you and I were speaking at, at, on another time and um, you know, these gastro, enterological um, capsules, the camera capsules mm -hmm. that are used by mm -hmm. gastroenterologists sometimes. Uh, you know, I yearn for the day when we can take samples um, 
temporally through the small intestine and oh. without contamination. So they'll sort of sample it and take it within the capsule for release later on. You know, I yearn for the day that we can actually sample the types of colonies that are growing in any one area. That would be so interesting mm. to tie it Incredible. Together. Yeah. yeah. Please yeah, invent it tomorrow. And- <laughs> yeah, yeah, get on that. <laughs> Smarter people than, uh, you know, you and I. Um, but I think that's important. And again, you know, when we're talking about this kind of overemphasis of the large bowel, like a lot of the um, assessment uh, methodologies and the testing, you know, that's developing in leaps and bounds. And, uh, you know, it's just because it's easier to sample. You sample the stool, you look at what's going on. Our, um, our technology for assessment is becoming better and better. We've gone from culture and microscopy to the 16S RNA, like DNA based. And, you know, for most of these tests that are available to, um, you know, the general public, 16S RNA can specify down to the genus. Now we have on the Australian market, thankfully, this great, almost like research-based stool testing for the general public. You don't even need a script from, uh, you know, uh, a practitioner to get this. And it's shotgun metagenomic testing. And we can get all the way down to um, the species and then even the strains within the species as well. So that is just developing like breakneck speed. It's bleeding edge science. And, um, you know, you'll see these bugs come back. They just have numbers. They don't even have names yet. So the research hasn't caught up to the technology. We still kind of don't really know what these bugs do, you know, how, um, you know, how they impact the digestive tract. The small bowel on the other side, it's right in the middle of our digestive tract. You know, culture, uh, sorry, the uh, aspirate and culture, uh, that was the gold standard for SIBO yep. uh, testing. It's, yep. it's, it's not terrible, but it's just never done because it's super expensive and it's invasive. Yeah. You know, you're, you're scoping and most people, you know, you're putting them under and uh, it's just, I, I've never seen anyone come to me with a SIBO diagnosis done that way. So we get the breath testing, there's an art and a science to it. The more patients you see and the more tests you see, the more you can line up that kind of clinical practice and that experience to say, look, these are the treatments that um, help most people in your position. If they don't, you know, like you mentioned, what what are we going to do? There's always these kind of second layers of herbs and prebiotics, probiotics, and then even a third level. And really, when we're talking about methane, you know, most patients improve, you know, I probably get about 75% of methane patients, depending on their numbers that, uh, you know, see significant improvements in, uh, in two or three months, and they're kind of, you know, important symptoms that they're trying to resolve. But uh, there's always those stubborn patients where you're looking for that little piece that's going to move the needle and improve the bloating and improve the distension. And the big, big, big headline symptom for the majority of methane producers, constipation and gut transit time delays. So things are just tracking through the digestive tract a lot slower than, um, you know, kind of the healthy individual. And and that's probably why they're experiencing uh, so many symptoms. Right. Um, can I just touch back on that shotgun metagen, um, metagenomics test? So yeah. they can elucidate not just the genus and species, but down to the strain. They've obviously got to match that up with certain strains that have been strain typed. So then you're going to have a hell of a lot in our guts that isn't strain typed. Um, <clears throat> but at least you'll be, because you're talking about metagenomics, so you're talking about DNA stuff, at least you'll yeah. get more than what we culture because, for instance, you know, segmented filamentous bacteria, people have heard me rave on just rabbit on about this thing. And the, the problem is that it's really hard to culture. If we use this mm-hmm. culture medium and that doesn't grow in it, then it's not going to mm-hmm. be seen. It doesn't exist mm-hmm. in the test that we do. So the problem is often the tests that we do aren't, spe- aren't sensitive enough to pick up everything that's in our gut. Even then, 
when you're looking at metagenomics, does that look also at, say, fungi? Or is it only bacterial? Yeah, it's the, the kind of majority that they're looking at is bacterial. This this uh, one gotcha. lab that I'm thinking of, it, you know, it'll it'll kind of uh, tell you a little bit about kind of blastocystis subtypes and candida. It's also looking for uh, okay. Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae. But, uh, you know, the majority of this one is... Um, bacterial and that just touches on like the perfect point you know if tests were free i just order them all right but yeah, it's, it's differentiating right. yeah your history your presentation and the clinical skills right that's the kind of uh, melting pot where you kind of tease out look i think we need to refer you back to your GP and do an H. pylori breath test. You know, I think that's important. Or look, right. I think we need to do a SIBO test frequently. And this, this is kind of more common lately. I'm doing small bowel assessment and I'm also doing large bowel assessment. And I will choose based on, you know, kind of a, a diagnosis, you know. So for example, if I'm working with inflammatory bowel disease, I want to know exactly what the makeup of that bacterial balance is. So I'll go more for like the shotgun metagenomics. Whereas if we're looking for, uh, look, you know, I'm experiencing abdominal pain. I get bloating after I eat lentils and, uh, you know, I'm constipated. I say, okay, look, let's, let's, let's assess you for SIBO. I'm putting my money on methane. I have totally been wrong. And that's why it's so important to test, you know, you can pick it pretty, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to pick. But there have always been these gotcha moments where a breath test will come back and your differential is methane for sure. And they're dealing with like a hydrogen dominant SIBO, which is um, generally loose watery bowel movements, right? That, that's, that's pretty common, yep. but uh, they've got constipation. Yep. So there's something else going on there right. that we have to tease out. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, this goes down to that differential diagnosis. You can also have physical issues. You know, what if they've had multiple surgeries, they've had an appendectomy and they've got um, adhesions? What if they've got rampant hemorrhoids? You know, I've seen mm -hmm. horrible wind, seen horrible. I've, I've um, seen patients that have had horrible problems with wind when they've been um, had really bad hemorrhoids. So there's a microbiome or microbiota changes even in the rectum, mm, you know? Mm, so Absolutely. But yeah, that's, yeah, and that's structural the practice, abnormality is big. Mm, exactly. And yeah. the more of these yeah. kind of unusual presentations, I can think of one patient that I just saw recently and uh, did not have even SIBO kind of in general on the differential. And, uh, you know, he managed to get a uh, breath test from the doctor because, you know, he's quite unwell and, uh, you know, mm. not the worst levels of methane, um, but definitely getting up into the mega methane picture, both large bowel. And we can see that as this kind of... Um, you know, parts per million on the baseline before they consume the sugar to test for uh, SIBO. And then also small bowel, you see that rise and that overproduction of methane, you know, within that, you know, 100 minute mark is, uh, you know, that's kind of a gray area, but that's, that's what we're looking for. And, you know, when we're different, you know, when we're, we're choosing our tests, you know, in a perfect world, I would run a lactulose, a glucose, and a fructose breath test on separate days, and we would get the most right. kind of granular data. And you just kind of like, I mean, I guess you can still miss SIBO, but the chances kind of are, um, are quite a bit lower. Uh, frequently, I'll do lactulose and glucose. That's just because testing isn't free, and also SIBO breath testing is a little bit painful. There's a whole process um what i'm pretty sure i might just go straight for the lactulose patients save money and then if it comes back with this abnormal reading we say okay look let's circle back and uh you know maybe we'll follow up with another breath test just to be a uh, hundred percent sure gotcha okay so let's dive into this typical management um obviously it's going to involve you know dietary modulation you know the fodmap is the hero diet of anybody suffering <laughs> ibs but what i'm picking up is that this might not actually help some of these patients is that right mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and you know i don't want to kind of bag the low fodmap diet too much but i will rarely rarely like restrict fodmaps completely particularly with the methane uh, producer 
Um, and that's because number one, I haven't found a low FODMAP diet to be curative. Great, great example. I tell everyone that I suspect has SIBO or everyone with a SIBO diagnosis, they all come to you. They say, look, we got to go low FODMAP. It makes me feel better. Great. Limit, restrict, eliminate those foods that make you symptomatic. That's important. We want you feeling better. But this story is of a patient who, you know, didn't know she had SIBO. She went low FODMAP on the recommendations of a previous practitioner, you know, kind of cured her symptoms, you know, maybe like 85% cured. She followed this low FODMAP diet, strict, strict, strict for seven years. Every time she ventured out and ate a FODMAP, she would wind up with symptoms. So I say, look, let's test you for SIBO. Seven years of low FODMAP, worst case, one of the worst cases of SIBO I've ever seen. So it's not curative, makes patients feel no. better. You get a bit of a buy-in and then you can kind of, um, you know, while they're feeling better, deal with that root cause. Um, on the methane front, you know, I'd love to share some of these kind of herbs that I love using and I find great kind of results with. I uh, use a heck of a lot of prebiotics in my clinical practice. There's, there's good reasons why in the, uh, in the evidence and uh, clinical practice. And occasionally I'll use probiotics as well with that methane presentation as well. Gotcha. I love that how you said it's it 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 is a great band-aid but it's kind of like giving morphine for a broken leg takes away the pain largely doesn't fix your broken leg um and and i don't know i always have issues with band-aids like they've got their place but recognize that what it is um it's kind of like people that have been long term on anti-candidate diets they're the most mm. emaciated um you know patients you've ever seen and they're nutritionally deficit um, so I've, I've always had sort of issues about, well, why should, shouldn't we be fixing the terrain while we've got them on this diet that's reducing their symptoms so that they're not feeling as lousy? Shouldn't we then use this time as a blessing to, to do some actual repair to the problem? I love that about you. It's fantastic. Mm, mm, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's important. You want to feeling good and you want to um, treat the root cause, you know, as you mentioned. So let's go into some of these roots. Herbs. Sorry. <laughs> excellent, best, excellent. Best humour I could do is late in the day. Um, so what sort of herbs and supplements do you tend to prefer sure. using? You mentioned lactulose just before. Um, That's what do right. you like? What do you tend to avoid as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. So for me... As a herbalist, um, you know, you can see it here. We're in our dispensary now. Um, I use liquid herbs. That's, that's my kind of first cab off the rank. Um, custom formulation. So that's really important. And, you know, we're treating the individual. That is so darn important. Like, I can't stress that enough. I've seen patients come to me chronically constipated. You know, they're skipping three, four days. They're bloated. They're distended. They're getting reflux. And uh, they're not feeling great either, right? Like um, quite fatigued and, uh, you know, achy. Of course, you need to be having a bowel movement every day. If you're not, that kind of main detox channel is impaired. It's kind of not working properly. So dealing with the symptoms when patients first come to me, Frequently, methane patients are constipated. That's, that's almost a given, you know, not always. And stimulating and getting those bowels kind of back on track is really important. So it depends on how constipated they are. Initially, you know, we will do the test. We'll get some results. We'll see the kind of levels. Just in my head, there's no research, um, you know, and I've got loads and loads of references that I sent over that, um, you know, hopefully they'll load up in the show notes. But personally for me, you know, kind of, you know, 10 to 20, 25 parts per million, that's a pretty kind of mild presentation of methane, you know, 25 to 40 or 50 parts per million um, is uh, moderate. Anything above 50, we're getting up into those extreme levels. And I've seen patients off the charts, like 150, you know, uh, parts per million of, of, of methane. Those patients aren't having bowel movements. Like they might have a bowel movement once a week, and that's because they're using these suppository laxatives. So my question is, how are you going to feel if we get you having a bowel movement once, twice a day? And uh, with those mm -hmm. patients, we'll pull out the uh, anthraquinone glycosides. 
Um, I know definitely from my education, um, had great education, but you know, every textbook that you read, short term use only, it is so much better for these people to be having bowel movements than to be using these anthraquinone glycosides in moderation, right? We're not using Senna. I use a whole lot of turkey rhubarb. That's kind of the next level down from something like cascara. I will use yeah. cascara if I have to. That's kind of second level when things aren't moving. And then right at the bottom of that kind of totem pole would be something like uh, yellow dock, which I don't use a whole lot. But there's good data showing that the anthraquinone glycosides and even the tannins in turkey rhubarb are anti-methane as well as being this laxative. So it's a double whammy. It's a formula in one herb. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's almost counterintuitive. In the olden days, we used to use tannins for diarrhea, but this is actually inhibiting the methanogenes. I hope I said that right. Um, <laughs> uh, so that they're the causation or part of the causation of constipation. So you're taking away the signal. Mm -hmm. So sort of in moderation. That's interesting. And you picked up on um, that immediately, immediately, like tannins, you know, and all of our yeah. data for the most part comes from uh, methane mitigation in livestock. And, uh, you know, I was sharing that with a patient of mine back in the day and he goes, well, I'm not a cow. Like, how's that relevant? <laughs> totally understand that, you know, it's animal data, but for, uh, you know, a lot of these kind of uh, studies, it's the best we have and tannins above and beyond most. Yeah, the volatile oils they are very uh, anti um, methanogen um, so big ones that i'll use frequently would be things like cinnamon which you're absolutely right they use as like an anti-diarrheal so it's kind of this cross signal where you know yeah. a moderate amount of cinnamon in the mix can uh, can really help kind of move the bowels particularly when you're getting uh, good exercise you've got the prebiotics in you know, a nutritionist might use, um, you know, something like a, a magnesium to soften the bowels, good exercise, electrolytes. There's this whole kind of raft of supportive therapies. Priority number one with a methane dominant SIBO patient that's constipated is just let's get those bowels moving and let's kick that gut transit time back into gear because that's what methane does to the gut, you know. A healthy individual, you know, 30 to 62% have methane, but it's really when it slows down that gut transit that, that patients wind up with all these symptoms. Gotcha. And you've mentioned lactulose quite a few times. What about the, I mean, the historical use of lactulose was for constipation. You know, you increase mm -hmm. it slowly and you end up, the, the joke is, till you're wiping yellow. Um, so <laughs> do you ever get quite heroic in the use of lactulose? Do you tend to titrate it up or? Lactulose is a difficult one to work with. So there's a little bit of a kind of misunderstanding. Like I definitely had this misunderstanding around lactulose. You use this lactulose to test for SIBO. So patients think, look, you know, like I tested for SIBO. It shows that lactulose feeds these bugs, which isn't quite correct, but that's, that's too nuanced. Why would I supplement lactulose? I bring in lactulose on the tail end of the treatment. And really that's in the maintenance phase. Um, I right. won't start with it because it's, it's a very fast burning prebiotic, hits the large bowel, gets fermented pretty quickly and uh, patients wind up more bloated and gassier. You know, on the other side, the large bowel, we're always working on the large bowel as well as the uh, small. That's just like a, an added benefit. All of these polyphenol rich herbs that I'm a huge fan of in whole herbs things like oregano, you know, also things like thyme, peppermint, as long as it's tolerated, that can be yeah. hard one to work with, with reflux patients, yeah. uh, clove yeah. as well. Not only do they have all these beautiful essential oils, cavacrol, thymol, eugenol, cinnamaldehyde and uh, cinnamon, they're also full of these tannins and polyphenols that work on the microbiome to balance and then you get this balanced microbiome if we're treating limo, so kind of uh, methane in the large bowel. And then ongoing, we can bring in something like lactulose on the other side of active treatment 
And this stops mm. them sliding back into this relapse, which is so darn common when you look at the literature. It's because it's they haven't corrected why. You know, SIBO is a symptom, right? And I know that kind of doesn't make any sense. And, you know, it's probably not technically accurate, but there's a reason why this uh, mm. bacterial overgrowth or this archaeal overgrowth has happened in the small bowel. It's not normal, right? So something's broken down in that whole yeah. process. With methane, it's delayed gut transit time. Everything just backs up and you just have to kind of kick it into gear, reduce the methane, balance the large bowel, and then send the patients on their way to focus on, um, you know, their stress management and, you know, getting good exercise and keeping up with their uh, kind of prebiotic and their fibers and stuff. Right. And with regards to bloating and wind, what about, you know, good old things like activated charcoal and, um, you know, bentonite? Um, and, mm. and also there was this, there was a lot of talk about uh, stimulants for the um, migrating motor complex, the MM. See, mm -hmm. um, how effective are they? I remember, like, one of the things was low dose naloxone. Um, mm. You know, that's obviously a prescription thing, but what other things do we have in our arsenal that we as natural medicine practitioners can use? Mm, yeah, yeah, I love that. So, you know, the big one there, like prokinetics, they can be really darn helpful. And, you know, if we're looking at uh, hydrogen dominant SIBO, frequently the root cause right we're looking for why was this um was this uh, food poisoning event and most mm. patients that you talk to with loose watery bowel movements and they haven't been well since their trip to india or bali they've had a pretty significant food poisoning event um, and that's kind of like the weak chain the weak link in the chain there um, on the methane side of things prokinetics can be really really helpful and again, this is where we have this beautiful kind of concept of like one herb as a formula, because something like turkey rhubarb, it's a laxative, it's got tannins in it, and it's also a pretty, pretty potent prokinetic. So it's stimulating that gut motility and, you know, whether that's acting on peristalsis, you know, the smooth muscle contractions to kind of regulate the digestive flow. But there's this whole raft of, you know, other herbs and, you know, kind of as a little like side project, I, I love diving into the uh, Chinese Materia Medica and they have mm. worked out so many prokinetic herbs, um, you know, really based on this kind of um, post um, uh, operational uh, stasis. I'm sure you've kind of come across this like anyone, most most patients that are having um, surgery done on their bowels will experience a little bit of the stasis post uh, post surgery. Most of the time it goes Oh, like away, a spastic ileum, that sort of... Exactly, yeah, yeah. 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 Most patients, yeah. it goes away yeah. and it's fine. In, in China, they, uh, they've done really good studies with uh, formulas that have things like magnolia bark. You know, that's just, that herb does everything. That's amazing. Mm. Uh, the other yeah. herbs in this formula, ginger, the other big um, herbs in this formula, like jishu, so a lot of patients, or sorry, a lot of practitioners, you know, naturopaths and herbalists, they'll know um, they'll know Chen Pi, right? And so that's the uh, that's the Mandarin peel. But Zhe Shi yeah. is this immature bitter orange, and it's got this pretty potent kind of prokinetic action on on the gut as well. So you put them all together in this you know custom formulation, based on you know the understanding of what's happening within this kind of, it's almost, it's not a syndrome, but like SIBO presentation varies from one patient to the next, you know, almost uh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, I noticed that you, you know, talking about magnolia, one of the effects of magnolia, it's not just a, um, with regards to magnolia, um, that it's used for stress situations, stressful situations. Mm. IBS is a, stress related condition um mm -hmm. do you employ stress acting herbs that also might have a visceral effect so things like for mm. instance kava wild yam any of these um, uh, um good old chamomile um to mm. help relax not just the patient but their guts so that, um, forgive me, I notice you haven't said cramping a lot. It's more bloating. But do they mm. have a, a positive effect in methane dominant SIBO or are they more mm. in hydrogen dominant SIBO? 
Mm -hmm. And I love that pickup. You know, there's, there's a heck of a lot of cramping. And a lot of that, again, is from that delayed gut transit and almost like right. this gas pain. So it's very sharp, yeah. very stabbing. It's almost like, uh, you know, the vents, you know, if people are burping a lot or they're having a lot of uh, flatulence, it's not great, but it's your vents are working. It's when that gas gets mm. trapped in the gut you wind up with this pain. For me, I'm always choosing kind of the, the best bang for the buck. And so I, I don't use a whole lot of spasmolytics initially, but focusing on stress can be an absolute game changer, huge, huge, huge pearl. And it's something that as kind of um, clinicians, you know, we, we pay so much lip service to the implications of, you know, bringing someone out of that, you know, stress, um, that fight flight mode into rest and digest, just absolutely huge. And, you know, you can go into the details around the vagal nerve being innervated by the parasympathetic nervous system. And it's mainly this afferent yeah. nerve and it gets complicated, but, you know, managing stress and, and kind of resolving and balancing that nervous system can be, um, you know, people's digestion can turn around uh, almost overnight. Got it. And, and what about, you know, actively reviewing patients and, and I'm, I'm going to sort of tie this up as a last question, I guess, but with regards to reassessing patients and how they're going and what sort of results can they expect and indeed when, mm -hmm. what happens with relapse, for instance, which is a common complaint mm -hmm. with IBS sufferers. Mm, yeah, no, it's absolutely huge. And, you know, for me, when people relapse, uh, the question is, like, what was the root cause? And have we addressed it? Um, you know, if we're looking for results, I'm looking for significant improvements. And, um, you know, if we're not getting those results, particularly with methane, which can be stubborn in a small subset, we're looking for reasons why. So like you mentioned, the nervous system, gut transit time, we're getting all this data from testing, feedback from the patient, you know, everything's coming in and we're reviewing. For me, you know, again, based on the labs, I like to draw a little line in the sand and I say, look at kind of month, you know, two or three, let's pause everything and let's have a really honest discussion about where we're at. As a clinician, my number one priority, top priority, almost the only priority is getting my patients better. So whether that's acupuncture, whether that's visceral manipulation, whether that's spending the money that they'd come to see me actually on going out and watching a movie and, you know, eating terrible food with their, with their partner and then feeling better kind of on the nervous system, so much better if they're seeing results there. So about at that time, again, depending on results, if it's more severe, we'll, we'll push that out. But we say, look, let's time everything out, have a recap, honest discussion. I like to retest a lot. Um, and, you know, recently I've been doing that, pushing for that a lot more and seeing methane's clear, methane's gone. So the symptoms you're experiencing, they're either on the cleanup side and the maintenance, or there's something we've missed or something's not quite resolved as well. And there's all this whole raft of conditions that mimic SIBO. So, you know, mm -hmm. fungal overgrowth and exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and, you know, just, just the whole, you know, leaky gut can, can be part of that as well. So, you know, I think that's important to be honest with your patients, tell them, look, methane can be stubborn. We're hoping that's not you. If it is, here's what we're going to do. And if these don't work, here are some of the referral options that, uh, you know, I, I've built here in Australia. I think that's really important. Todd, I just you're, you've obviously got a true dedication to your patients and I, I applaud you, sir. Um, it shows through in whatever you do. It's just searching for the answer, whatever answer that may be, and from whichever clinician that may be to help your patients. Mm -hmm. I really applaud you for that. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much <laughs> for you. sharing this knowledge of yours today. It's like it's 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 embarrassing me because I know so little, um, <laughs> but I've got so much to learn. But thanks so That's much great. for really enjoyed through it. this. Well, I'm going to have you back on the show again on another stage, hopefully, great. and we'll we'll talk about That'd some other gut-related disorders. Excellent. Yeah, we look forward to it. And, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share small bowel. Look at the small bowel. You know, if you're not looking at the small bowel, you know, if, if you're treating digestion, you're not looking at the small bowel, you know, it's, it's low hanging fruit for a lot of your patients. So check it out. 
And thanks for having thanks, me. Todd. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Remember, you can catch up on the show notes from this podcast and all the other podcasts on the Designs for Health website. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. This is Wellness by Designs. Thank you.